Faith in the Fog is based on an excellent sermon series presented by Pastor Lance Lowell of Neighborhood Church in Modesto, California. Pastor Lowell gave me his sermon notes and encouraged me to design a video series. The episodes that you will see are a collaboration between Pastor Lowell and myself. I hope you enjoy this production. The alarm goes off, and it's time to go to work. It's a cold winter morning, and you know the fog will be thick. While getting ready, you look in the mirror and wonder, is my life covered in a thick blanket of confusing fog? I don't seem to have a clear spiritual direction. I thought being a Christian would bring peace and clarity, but why am I so confused? Off to work you go, driving through this fog. It's thick and gray and very wet. It's difficult to see the road, but you notice that you're in a flow of traffic slowly inching through the fog. Fog can be very dangerous. You can't trust what you see. You think a stop sign is coming into view, but it's not. Should you stop on the road, you could cause an accident. Therefore, you slowly drive on, not knowing what lies ahead. A gray blanket of nothingness covers you and you can't see what lies ahead. You don't know what is around you. Fog is a deceiver. It distorts the truth. Nothing is in focus. You cannot trust what you see when you're in the fog. Fog can be an effective metaphor that can illustrate the confusion and difficulties that frustrate our relationship with Jesus Christ. There are times in our walk with Jesus that a spiritual fog can cloud our minds with the gray nothingness of self-doubt. There is a military term used to describe combat situations. It's called the fog of war. This term is used to describe the uncertainty in situational awareness experienced by participants in military operations. We can appropriate this term to describe the uncertainty of life that can confront us each and every day. This would be the fog of life. Life can be an unpredictable adventure. But the question that we must answer is, how do we navigate through our own spiritual fog? This is the question that we will answer through this video series entitled faith in the fog. We often visualize the disciples of Christ in the New Testament as great men and women of faith who can overcome any obstacle in a single bound. They never knew pain or frustration. They never experienced confusion or self-doubt. They were super disciples. It's important to understand that this image of the New Testament disciple is clouded by the fog of spiritual doubt. The great apostles of the faith were men just as we are, 
the spiritual fog surrounded them just as it surrounds us. There is one story in the Gospels that clearly exemplifies the gray nothingness of self-doubt, fear, and confusion. The Chosen Twelve trudged through the uncertainty of their spiritual fog when they encountered the frightening storm on the Sea of Galilee. This event will be our theme text through this video series. Let's read. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars, because the wind was against them. Let me paint the picture. The spiritual fog that surrounded the disciples on the Sea of Galilee during the storm was at the end of a great day of ministry with Jesus. The disciples saw the sick healed and heard the gospel preached, but the greatest miracle of the day was the feeding of 5,000 with five loaves of bread and two fishes. Imagine the euphoria these followers of Christ must have experienced. The day was ending on a high note. When we think the day is over and we can let our guard down, a spiritual fog can encompass with fear, confusion, and self-doubt. Once the ministry of the day was complete, Jesus instructed his disciples to get into a boat and meet him in Bethsaida, on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, while he dismissed the crowd and withdrew into the mountain to pray. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was not with the disciples. The weather turned, and the lake became dangerous. The disciples knew their destination, but the wind blew so strongly against them that they could not make headway. All their human strength and effort strained at the oars, but they made little progress against the wind. This was a dangerous situation. They knew that the boat was in serious jeopardy of being swamped, and death by drowning was imminent. Where is Jesus? We are going to die, and he is not with us. And that quick the spiritual fog surrounded the disciples. Fear, not faith, became their natural human reaction. It is easy to look at the reaction of the disciples in the storm and think, I wouldn't have reacted that way. I would have trusted Jesus to save me. Let's not be too quick to judge because we are just like the disciples. Human nature does not change. It is very human to respond with fear, not faith, when spiritual fog surrounds us. Let's apply this narrative to the conditions of life we confront daily. Have there been times in your Christian walk when you questioned the presence of Jesus? Where did Jesus go? Your life is filled with confusion and you're stressed out. 
You don't know where Jesus is. You just don't know. You thought this Christian thing would be much easier. You're anxious and alone. You feel like you're in a storm and you're fighting against the wind. You just don't feel the presence of God anymore. It seems like God is a million miles away. What are you to do? A gray blanket of nothingness covers you and you cannot see what lies ahead. You have entered a spiritual fog and all around you seems distorted. Fog is fickle. It can surround us quickly, but just as quickly it can lift and be burned away by the sun. Fog can also settle in and last for days. At night, the fog can become thick, wet and cold, and it can also form a frosty covering of ice. During the day, the fog lifts slightly and warms enough to melt the frost. But the fog still distorts what we see. Then at night, the cycle repeats. Day after day, we never clearly see the sun. We live in a gray cloud of nothingness, alone and cold. The foggy season we experience in the Central Valley of California is a very descriptive metaphor we can use to describe our personal Christian experience. Remember, spiritual fog is a deceiver. It distorts the truth and nothing is in focus. We cannot trust our feelings when we are in a spiritual fog. We all thought being a Christian would be a fun-filled, exciting adventure where we bask in the warm glow of God's holy presence. Prayer would be easy and angels would come out and dance on every page of the Bible. We also thought that all our Christian brothers and sisters would be well-meaning people who would care for our souls. Should this be the image we have of the Christian faith, then the deception of spiritual fog has clouded the truth to us. When the fog rolls in, our spiritual perception can be shrouded in a gray cloud of nothingness. God feels far away. Our spiritual sight is distorted and our spiritual hearing is confused. A spiritual fog can last for only a day, but it can also last for weeks, months, or even years we feel as if we are traveling through life in a tunnel. The excitement is gone and we walk out our Christian experience one gloomy day at a time. Corey Ten Boom, a well-known author and Christian who was imprisoned at the Ravensbrück concentration camp during World War II, made the following statement. When a train goes through a tunnel and the tunnel gets super dark, don't panic and jump off the train. Just sit still and trust the conductor. When we go through the dark tunnels of our spiritual fog, 
it's so important that we remain seated and trust that the conductor knows where he is going and what he is doing. Who is our spiritual conductor? This is a question that every Christian must answer. Our answer cannot change, even though we are in the midst of a dark spiritual fog. We read in the Bible that Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. And we can be confident in this one thing, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Jesus is our conductor. He is our Savior and Lord. We learn about our conductor from the Bible. But this fact produces another question. Can we trust the Bible? Should our answer be no, then we are now at the root of our spiritual fog. But should our answer be yes, then we have a conductor of our soul who is doing his work in us. Even though we don't see it or feel it, we are moving down the track to spiritual completion. Our faith in Jesus and his Bible will hold us secure in our gray nothingness. It is so important that we remember to remain seated in Christ during our spiritual season of fog. Don't make any serious life-changing decisions or serious moves during this time because we cannot trust our feelings and emotions. Our spiritual fog has deceived and clouded our minds to the truth found in Jesus and his Bible. Stay seated and trust the conductor. There is an important verse in the Bible we cannot ignore. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Our Christian experience is a walk of faith, not of sight, emotion, or feeling. We stand or fall before God by the faith we have in Him, not by our external display of religious feelings. Should we trust more in our sight than our faith, we are prime targets for the gray nothingness of spiritual fog. In the Central Valley of California, fog can form during the winter when the weather conditions are right, when the air mass over the valley is thick with humidity and cold, dense air is hovering over the valley floor. Fog forms when a warm air mass hovers over the cold air. The water droplets form a cloud, and that cloud is our valley fog. When calm conditions remain over the valley, Fog can last for days or weeks. It's important to know that weather conditions must be right for fog to form. The same thing can happen in our spiritual walk with Jesus Christ. Just as in nature, should the conditions be right, a spiritual fog will naturally form. What are some of the reasons that could cause a spiritual fog to form?
choices, the path we walk in our Christian experience is filled with choices. Ultimately, we become the sum total of the choices we make, either good or bad. There are times when God feels far away, and He might be distant. Just remember one simple truth. God didn't move from us. We moved from Him. Through the choices we make, we move away from God in order to feed the lusts that plague our souls. Let's read. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of the eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. When our personal lusts become inflamed, we openly disobey God. Our actions speak louder than our words. Subtly, little by little, we want Jesus to move away from us. Our actions speak clearly. Jesus, get away from me. The Apostle James wanted his readers to realize that but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. God didn't walk away from us. We walked away from Him. Through our pride, and willful disobedience, we allow a spiritual fog to form between God and us. Though the Lord is on high, He looks upon the lowly, but the proud He knows from afar. Pride and lust can create the right spiritual conditions that allow a spiritual fog to form. Don't blame God for the gray nothingness that surrounds us. We might be the source of the problem. Nothing like going to the doctor and hearing the inevitable diagnosis. You have high blood pressure and you're a borderline diabetic. You need to exercise and lose weight. Exercise? Going to the gym? This doesn't sound like fun. In fact, it sounds like hard work. Those who are involved in an exercise regimen know the expression, no pain, no gain. Work is necessary to maintain physical health. Without exercise, we do not strengthen our core muscles and our health declines. The Apostle Peter used this illustration to teach on the importance of exercising our faith to develop the qualities necessary to be productive in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's read. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, 
They will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. The Amplified Bible brings greater clarity to this scriptural reference. For this very reason, apply your diligence to the divine promises. Make every effort in exercising your faith to develop moral excellence. And in moral excellence, knowledge, insight, understanding, and in your knowledge, self-control and in your self-control, steadfastness, and in your steadfastness, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly affection, and in your brotherly affection, develop Christian love. That is, learn to unselfishly seek the best for others and to do things for their benefit. For as these qualities are yours, and are increasing in you as you grow towards spiritual maturity. They will keep you from being useless and unproductive in regard to the true knowledge and greater understanding of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is blind, short-sighted, closing his spiritual eyes to the truth, having become oblivious to the fact that he was cleansed from his old sins. This reference makes clear the importance of exercising our faith because it is the core spiritual muscle that develops the other qualities that are necessary to walk with Jesus Christ. We all know the consequences we suffer when we don't heed our doctor's warning. Our health declines and we are prone to all sorts of illnesses that will capitalize on our physical idleness. Peter also warned his readers about the consequences of not exercising our faith. We become short-sighted to the truth, and we are oblivious to the fact that our old sins are eroding our spiritual health. Doesn't this sound like the consequences of living in a spiritual fog? This all may be true, but why does God allow trials and temptations to challenge our spiritual walk. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in just one sentence answered this question. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. It's true, the faith and character of a person is displayed during seasons of trial, temptation, and challenge. It is easy to maintain the Christian faith during seasons of comfort and convenience, but it is more difficult to maintain our Christian witness during times of challenge and controversy. God uses the testing of our faith to develop our character and trust in the Holy Scriptures. Faith will not grow and mature unless it is stretched and challenged. The natural human condition is to seek out comfort and convenience. During these seasons, we bask in our fuzzy spiritual feelings. But God doesn't need our feelings. He needs our faith. 
the Apostle Peter realized this truth. Let's read. In this you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proven genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. James also understood this principle. Let's read. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Teachers today use tests to determine the depth of understanding the student has with the material being taught. God does the same thing. He uses tests to determine the depth of our faith. The problem we have is that these divine tests can be viewed as seasons of spiritual fog. So, when God wants to help us grow, he can become silent. Is it possible that our spiritual fog could be caused by a spiritual war that is raging in us? Satan will know if our Christian experience is built on high octane, emotional, warm, fuzzy feelings or not. In the same way that Satan sifted the faith of Peter, he desires to sift our faith as well. It is so important to remember that emotional, warm fuzzies cannot be the foundation of our faith. The Apostle Paul admonished the Ephesians to not give the devil a foothold. Our feelings can be that foothold. Our spiritual fog could be the result of the devil having a foothold in our faith. we see a perfect example of this type of spiritual warfare in the Last Supper narrative presented in the New Testament. Let's read. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back strengthen your brothers. Jesus understood that emotions clouded the faith of Peter and that his faith was fragile. Therefore, he prayed for Peter that his faith would not fail. Peter did not realize that within a few short hours a deep spiritual fog of fear would cause him to deny Jesus three times. Satan took advantage of Peter because his emotions were the foothold he needed to attack his faith. The Apostle Paul also wanted Timothy to understand that human emotions can become the snare used by the devil to attack the faithful. Let's read. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God preadventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, 
who are taken captive by him at his will. As with Peter, so it is with us. Our emotions can become the snare used by the devil to take us captive and hold us in the prison house of our spiritual fog. Remember, the devil can only have a foothold to the degree we give him a foothold. Paul also admonished the Ephesians to put on the whole armor of God that they may be able to stand against the devil's schemes. Just remember this simple truth. The armor of God is designed to give us defensive capabilities against the wiles of the devil. But our feelings and emotions can frustrate the armor of God. Let's take the time to be introspective. Is it possible that our spiritual fog stems from our inflamed pride and emotions? Are our hurt feelings causing us to stumble in our faith? Should our answer to these questions be yes, then we have given a foothold to the devil and we are the source of our problem. We all know what happens to marriages who spend little time in communication. They grow distant and can die. They call this death of marital relationship divorce. Relationship requires work and commitment. Without an investment of our time, relationships can shrivel and die just like a garden without nurture. It's so important we understand that Jesus did not come to give us a religion about God. He came to give us a relationship with God. Let's consider the possibility that our spiritual fog is the natural result of our not having a true relationship with God. What kind of result should we expect from this type of relationship? How much time are we investing in our walk with Jesus? God will reciprocate the relationship we give to Him. James wanted his readers to understand that God will come near to us to the degree we come near to him. Let's read. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Is it possible that the distance we have with God is the result of our not investing in a relationship with Him. Maybe we are reaping what we have sown. Should we back away from God by not reading His Word or engaging in relationship through prayer, then we might only know God from a distance. Just remember, God did not leave us. We left Him. It's our fault. Is it possible that we could be addicted to our feelings? Science suggests that it is possible they have found a link between our feelings and the endorphins we have in our bodies.
endorphins are morphine-like chemicals produced by the body to help diminish pain while triggering positive feelings. Endorphins are sometimes referred to as the brain's feel-good chemicals and are the body's natural painkillers. I think it's possible to become addicted to feelings. We are in a constant search for the endorphin rush we get from our emotional highs. We want to experience and maintain the rush of our feelings. When we become motivated by our feelings, it affects every area of our lives, from the entertainment we enjoy to our most intimate relationships. We often start relationships and quit relationships because of the depth of our feelings. Our feelings become the lens through which we view the world. We see life through the tint of our rose-colored glasses. Should events or relationships challenge our rosy view of life, then a spiritual fog sets in and our lives become confused and distorted. The church is aware of our addiction to feelings. They fill their worship with bright strobe lights, smoke machines, and loud, upbeat music. The more churches entertain their congregations, the more they can stimulate strong, positive feelings. Preachers will cater their sermons to entertain their congregations because they want to stimulate these strong, positive feelings they will often back away from the hard truths of the Bible to feed our emotional needs. Paul prophesied that this day would come. Let's read. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Pastors shy away from certain biblical truths out of fear that they would lose their congregations. So, feelings often dictate the depth of truth in our congregations, not faith. Don't be too hard on the teachers and preachers in our congregations because they feed us the spiritual food we demand. Let's consider three principles that can help stabilize us when the spiritual fog sets in. The first principle is, don't sit down spiritually. Keep doing what the Lord told you to do before the fog set in. It's important to remember that fog is a deceiver. It distorts the truth, nothing is in focus. We cannot trust what we see in the fog. The light of day is filtered through a gray nothingness. A spiritual fog is just like the real thing. Just as the light of the sun is filtered by the fog, the light of God is also filtered through the spiritual fog of confusion and self-doubt. The confusion, fear, and self-doubt we see in the disciples during the storm is a clear example how circumstances can frustrate the working of our faith. But there is one thing the disciples did that was right. They kept 
rowing during the storm. Should they have stopped rowing and yielded to their fear, the boat would have capsized and they all would have died. Let's glean truth from this example. The disciples kept doing the work of the Lord, even in storm and fog. When a spiritual storm surrounds us, we must keep rowing. Don't stop doing the work of the Lord simply because it's cold and foggy. Don't stop attending church simply because the thrill is gone. This is a big mistake. We cannot let feelings dictate when we read our Bibles or pray. Don't stop doing God's work simply because the fog sets in. Now is the time to trust in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Trust builds faith, not feelings. When we trust in the name of our Lord, we are trusting in His character. This truth brings us to our next example. Remember, the Lord's character can be trusted even when your feelings cannot. Let me paraphrase Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It is easy to trust the Lord when all things are comfortable and convenient, but it's much more difficult to trust the Lord during times of challenge and controversy. What is trust? Trust is an assured reliance on the character, ability, strength, or truth of someone or something. Can we trust the Lord? Let's read. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. What happens when we lean on our own understanding? Our feelings cloud our judgment, and our spiritual path becomes distorted and out of focus. What does it mean to acknowledge the Lord? The Hebrew word used in this verse for acknowledge is yada, which means to know, to ascertain by seeing, to recognize. There is only one way we can acknowledge the Lord. In the context of Proverbs 3.6, we must have an intimate relationship with Jesus. When we have a relationship with Jesus, we can trust Him to make our paths straight. Should we trust in Jesus to save us, then we should trust that He will keep us on a straight path while we are in the fog. When the Bible says to trust in the name of the Lord, can we also trust in His character to keep His word? This thought brings us to our third principle. Lean hard upon the Word of God. What value do we place on the Bible? Do we see the Bible as the Holy Word of God? Can we trust the truths recorded in the Bible? How we honestly answer these questions will determine to what degree the Bible can help us. We are exhorted in Psalm 119 that the Word of God is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We don't understand the true value of this Bible promise until we are surrounded by the gray nothingness of our spiritual fog. 
Without light to guide us, we drift in the fog, not having a clear direction. In a way of speaking, the Bible functions as our fog lamps, and these lamps shine more light on the road we are traveling. The distortion of fog yields to the light generated by these types of lamps. Psalm 119 also exhorts us that great peace can be found by those who love God's Word. Let's read. Great peace have they who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. When we lean upon the Bible, the things that could cause us to stumble gradually fall away. What things are we talking about? The Hebrew word mikshol, used in this verse for stumble, literally means a stumbling block or an obstacle or enticement that could cause us to fall. The word also implies that our stumbling block is any idol that entices us away from Jesus Christ. Consider for a moment where we invest our time. These are the idols we allow in our lives. Is it possible that our personal idols are the things that cause our spiritual fog? Those who lean upon the Word of God have a fog lamp that will guide their spiritual walk. Should we be able to trust the character of Jesus Christ, we can also trust the character of His Holy Word. We can trust the Word of God when we cannot trust our feelings. Sometimes our spiritual fog can be our friend. We can learn more about God when we don't feel His presence. God could be using us to change the world. Jesus Christ did His most hell-defying, God-honoring work when He was feeling absolutely deserted by God. Sometimes, when I'm feeling God the least, I'm pleasing God the most. At the end of World War II, the Allied forces raced across Germany to end the war. U.S. forces liberated the German concentration camp of Dachau. The sight and smell of death was everywhere bodies stacked on top of bodies. What a horrid sight. How could such evil happen? Dachau was predominantly a Jewish prison camp, but a large contingency of Christian ministers who actively resisted Nazism were also imprisoned there. Two American soldiers raced into one of the cells to release the prisoners. They threw open the doors and yelled, You're free! We've won! You're free! The doors are open and you can leave! These two soldiers saw older Christian ministers sitting with their heads down weeping. A third prisoner was stretched out on a primitive hard cot with a sheet over him. He had taken his last breath only moments before liberation. The soldiers walked in the cell in sober respect for the deceased pastor. The Allied soldiers respectfully asked if they could have the honor of carrying the minister's body out of the dirty cell for a proper burial. As they lifted the deceased pastor onto a stretcher, his arm fell. They noticed that the minister's right index finger was nothing more than a bloody stub. 
Was this how they tortured him? The soldiers asked, assuming that the pastor's finger had been amputated by the Nazis. No, that's not how it happened, the prisoners replied, as they pointed towards the crumbling brick wall at the end of the darkness. Go, read what it says. For the last four and a half years, every day, he has taken that one finger and used it as a pencil on the brick to write that message. A pencil? The soldiers asked, still not grasping what had happened. Yes, he spent hours every single day retracing the message he left on the wall. He pressed so hard that his blood became the ink of his finger. Our friend was determined that the Nazis would not defeat his faith. He wanted to leave a message for the whole world to read. Then, without a word, the soldiers read the message. I believe in the sun, even when it's not shining. And I believe in love, even when there's no one there. And I believe in God, even when he's silent. I believe through all trial, there is always a way. But sometimes, in this suffering and hopeless despair, my heart cries for shelter to know someone's there. But a voice rises within me, saying, Hold on, my child. I'll give you strength. I'll give you hope. Just stay a little while.